The HRC strategy is called the Human World, the Arts and Humanities for Our Time, and it lasts us until 2018. The human world uh, is, of course, something which all disciplines and all research councils contribute to. What we were trying to identify is the distinctive contribution of the arts and humanities. What is it that we particularly bring to the study of our culture, our society, our sense of well-being, and our proud intellectual and cultural and artistic heritage? The Arts and Humanities community is the largest single disciplinary community in the UK. It's about 14,000 researchers. It's 50 different disciplines, and so you can well imagine the range of research we support is extraordinary. For example, we fund research that goes into exhibitions at major museums. I went and visited the Haj exhibition at the British Museum this year. It's a study made annually by Muslims to Mecca in order to celebrate their faith. And one of the extraordinary things when I went to see it is there were a lot of people who I th at first thought were guides to the exhibition, but in fact turned out, like me, to be people coming and visiting. The difference was that they were Muslims and they were keen to tell people about their faith and their history, and that was such an exhilarating moment. We've launched four hubs for the creative economy. We're doing a project on copyright because in the new technologies, uh, intellectual property is key. And we're looking at a number of other examples in the way in which we can use digital technologies to develop and stimulate and transmit the work of researchers. It's crucial, of course, that we understand our past and we understand our culture. One example would be the fantastic Portus project. Now, Portus was the ancient Roman port some distance away from Rome. And over a number of years, we, along with partners in the British School of Rome, the British Academy, University of Southampton, University of Cambridge, and others, including Italian partners, have been involved in a very large-scale investigation of this extraordinary ancient port. It's uncovered old shipyards, it's uncovered old warehouses, it's uncovered old evidence about the kind of trade and the trade routes that took place. It's the most exciting thing in itself, but also because it reveals the potential of collaborative organisation across nations and across different sorts of disciplines. So it's not all about zesty new technologies. It's also about the virtues of the traditional book and the kind of information that it can capture and the punchy evidence that can be provided through articles and other sources of evidence. For example, Robert Bickers, a scholar at the University of Bristol, on the 19th century development of the Chinese treaty ports, including Hong Kong. I read that recently and it is the most wonderful and engaging piece of writing. The research world generally is changing very considerably. It's changing for all sorts of reasons. The impact of electronic technologies, the increasing globalisation of the research endeavour, and the increasing involvement in government as well. But if you look 10, 15 years ahead, then you see a number of things which are very evident. One is, I think, that research will be increasingly produced collaboratively between different organisations and not just within single organisations. And that those organisations will, will include not just universities, but all parts of our growing and extremely successful knowledge economy. So I think that will be a dramatic change. I think increasingly as well, research is funded by multiple agencies in very different ways, and those agencies include international organisations. So we're having to work with funding partners to try and develop this. And I think finally as well, modern problems in the world are extremely complicated and they do require interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary solutions to try and address them. So we're looking at that changing environment and trying to think in what ways can we enable attention to it from the arts and humanities community. But at the same time, of course, we've got very, very, very successful disciplinary groups within the arts and humanities, and we have to maintain our support for them as well. Currently, around 70% of our funding goes in responsive mode, and we don't imagine a radical shift in that. But we have to, given the way the climate is changing, we also have to enable new ways of working. 
So it's going to be a balancing act of trying to develop and respond to the new initiatives as well as sustaining the existing excellence that we have. We're moving into a different period, uh, a period where we will need to prioritise the way in which we invest resource in the arts and humanities and I believe the strategy both sends signals and sets up the right kind of debate uh, for that. I think what it does is make some very timely uh, interjections about what the arts and humanities are for. I mean, a sense that this is where the critical engagement with the past, the present and the future happens. My day job is in UCL. Um, UCL will certainly look at the HRC new strategy. They'll want to compete for things like the fellowships. Um, they also want to think creatively about what arts and humanities research means in a new age. There are sections you'll find there on research and how we fund that both in responsive and strategic modes. There's a look at people and how we support research careers from the earliest beginnings as postgraduate researchers right through to the most senior levels of the academic profession. There are sections on knowledge exchange and how we feed our work into the creative economy and our cultural and civic institutions. There are sections on international work and how we develop partnerships and schemes and co-developed research across the world. And there are sections also on advocacy and how we make the crucial case for the importance of the arts and humanities and gain contact with our public, gain contact with society at large and make them understand what it is that's so important about our history and our culture for their own individual well-being. And also, and we mustn't underestimate this, for the economic well-being of Britain. I think if I can put on a lens of the great cultural institutions, the galleries, the museums, and also the strength of our creative industries, if you put all that together with the extraordinary, excellent research, and therefore the sort of potential for joined up partnerships, um, I think we have a winning formula here. The new strategy will allow our researchers to be ever more ambitious and imaginative in the research that they undertake. It will enable them to form new collaborations with overseas researchers. It will give them more time to pursue big research projects over a longer period. It will allow them to interact with researchers within their own disciplines and beyond their own disciplines as well. So in other words, we will enable research to be undertaken that might not otherwise have happened without the support of the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Steve Jobs said, it's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough and that it's technology married to liberal arts, married with humanities, that yields results. And I think that's a pretty good mantra for us to have. Research is fundamentally a people business, and that's what we're interested in doing. We're supporting the best people on the best projects. When you think about what Britain is really, really good at, higher education, research, those are right at the top of the tree. But the other thing we're so great at is the creative industries and the creative economy and the cultural life of this country, which has intangible, positive, rippling effects across the world in terms of the way other countries see us, in the way they trust us. We're in austere times, no one can escape that. But those who think it's all a question of just investing in manufacturing or just investing in engineering or the hard sciences really need to wake up to the realities of our current way of life. The creative economy of Britain is something we should be celebrated and we've got a fantastic chance to contribute to that very, very significantly indeed.